On this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast, I talk about the amazing life of Harry Keller. That and more on Episode 8 of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie, and I am the Magic Detective. And this is Episode 8. Did I mention that already? I may have. I'm very excited to be at Episode 8 because that means I'm one away from Episode 9, which means nothing um, other than I'm one or two away from being in double digits. Whoa, that's exciting. So today I'm going to be talking about the amazing life of Harry Keller, uh, the first, the first world famous American magician. So um, stay tuned for that. But right now I want to just cover a little bit of news, a little bit of uh, information for you. The first I mentioned in a previous podcast about a documentary that I had the good fortune to record. Well, I just found out that that documentary is going to air this week, this Wednesday. It's going to air on French television. So if you're a listener from France, then you get to watch it on Wednesday. And if you're not, oh well. No, actually, if if you're from anywhere else, like America, for example, you can watch it online. uh, They will post it on the internet, and I will make sure to post a link over on my blog, themagicdetective.com. So once it airs, I'll put the link up so everybody can watch it. The documentary, it's a short piece. I think it's around seven minutes. I'm assuming it's something like that. It's about Houdini in Congress. So we shot it in Washington, D.C. We shot it right in front of the Capitol building. It was a lot of fun to do. The only unfortunate thing is it's going to be dubbed over in French, so you may not even hear my voice at all, but uh, but the content is there, the information is there, so uh, and, and it was fun to do. So I will put that up on my blog the moment uh, I get the link. So that's something to look forward to. I have uh, a really out-of-the-box idea for a future episode of the podcast. And what I'm thinking of doing is doing basically what you would call an old-style radio play uh, or an old-style radio drama. And um, just to give you a little bit of information, a few years ago, I wrote a short story about Harry Keller, coincidentally enough. The story is, uh, everything in the story, well, not everything, but most everything in the story is uh, historically accurate, but it's written in a fictional way. So what I'm thinking of doing is rewriting that a little bit, just scripting it out some more so we could actually do it like a play. So that means I would need a couple actors to help me uh, in the process and sound effects and that whole kind of thing. So basically just making it like an old style radio play. It's something to look forward to. Um, like I said, it's still in planning stages, but I think it would be a lot of fun. And if it turns out to be popular, I have a couple other ideas for for other um, stories as well. And uh, speaking of out of the box thinking, uh, you know, I, I'm doing these podcasts on different magicians and their lives and giving you a lot of historical information and stories and things. And I was wondering recently, uh, is there another way to do this or, you know, kind of a different twist or different take on it? And one of the ideas I came up with was actually to present to you interviews with these dead people, um, because most of the people I'm talking about have long since passed away. What I may do is, uh, in a, and I'm just going to test it out once in the future, is write the podcast like an interview. So I'll be interviewing whoever the dead person is, and I'll bring an actor in to, uh, to read their part. So I think it might be kind of a, a fun thing uh, to do, just a different way of you know approaching the whole concept. Uh, in December, the Magic Detective podcast will have my first ever contest. So, and if it's a contest, it means there'll be prizes. So you can look forward to that. The podcast is now on multiple platforms. You can find me in lots of different places. Stitcher.com, which is a popular podcasting uh, site. I'm now on there. Spotify, which is kind of a, a music site, but they're doing podcasts now. If you go on Spotify and or use the Spotify app and you click on podcasts, you can search for The Magic Detective that way. If you just try to search without going into the podcast section, nothing will come up. I found that out from checking it out myself. Um, iTunes, the 
podcast is on iTunes. Yay. Thank you, Apple. And I'm also on the Apple podcast app. So you, you can use that on your iPhones to listen to the, uh, the podcast. I'm on Google music play, which is something we just got put on the other day. So I'm excited about that. And I think there's like three or four other platforms who, uh, whose name, um, is not coming back to me immediately. So, but there, needless to say, there are a lot of different ways that you can find the podcast these days. So that means if you're listening uh, on a tablet or iPhone or Android device or, or computer, whatever, there are lots of different ways to find the podcast. And I did that for you guys and gals. Oh, and here's something you can do for me. Something I'm hoping people would do. And <laughs> it's like, Pulling teeth, so come on, people, get with the program. Um, if you wouldn't mind liking the podcast, commenting on the podcasts, sharing the podcasts, and or subscribing, that would be awesome. I actually do have several subscribers, so thank you so much for those folks that subscribe, and thank you to everyone that listens to the podcast. I really appreciate it. We're up to around three hundred and fifty or so downloads at this point. And once this podcast goes out, that'll shoot up another, uh, another 30 really, really quickly. So I'm hoping, and I might be crazy to hope this, but I'm hoping to hit over a thousand, uh, downloads of the podcast by the end of the year. So if I can, great. If not, I'm going to do my best to reach it. Uh, eventually it will be like the, uh, like my blog, which is, uh, millions of views. So the same thing will eventually happen with the podcast. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to cover really quick? Oh, upcoming podcasts include the, the life story of Robert Heller, the life story of the great Morrow, uh, a lot more on Houdini. There's the Houdini, uh, just, I get, get down in the, the minutia of Houdini's life. You know, I did a beginner's guide to Houdini and I didn't do part two of that, which, you know, again, gives you more information about the life of Houdini. I stopped at where Houdini married Bess, or actually I stopped at where Houdini met Bess. So I've got to do the second part of that, but I'll continue doing Houdini podcasts for a long time because there's just so much information on his life and different aspects of his life and different approaches that you can take. I have a very clever, uh, idea I came up with the other day when I was driving. I'm like, Oh, this would make a great podcast. And Oh, speaking of, uh, if you happen to have an idea for a podcast, you'd be interested in uh, a podcast episode. Let me know. You can, uh, uh, reach me through the, um, through email on my blog there or, uh, here on the podcast. Just, uh, the, the best way to do it is info at Carnegie magic.com. That's info at Carnegie magic.com. And, uh, if you've got an idea for a podcast episode, let me know. I've got a buddy of mine who, uh, he contacts me almost after every episode and man, is he giving me great information, great feedback on the podcast and, Great information about upcoming episodes and uh, things that I will be using uh, a great deal of it, if not all of it. So, Gary, thank you very much for that. So, let's get into today's feature, and that is The Amazing Life of Harry Keller. Before I actually get into the life story of Harry Keller, I want to talk about The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz, of course, is a story written by L. Frank Baum, it later turned into a very popular musical movie uh, was also it's also been a play it's a, there's another version of the movie that came out a couple of years ago but the character of the wizard in the wizard of oz is actually based upon harry keller at the time the book was written harry keller was the most famous magician in america and if you look up early versions early editions of the wizard of oz book the wonderful wizard of oz i believe is the name of the actual book you will see illustrations that show a bald-headed wizard, which looks just like Harry Keller, who was, oddly enough, a bald-headed wizard. So I guess, uh, in a way, I knew about Harry Keller before ever knowing about Harry Keller. Just to add on to it, I remember when I first saw the Wizard of Oz movie, the character that Frank Morgan plays early on, who is uh, Professor Marvel, I always kind of thought later, years later, I thought, ah, I bet that's what Harry Keller was probably like. He was probably very much like 
Professor Marvel and later the Wizard of Oz. And sure enough, come to find out, that is the case. Uh, Harry Keller was the model for that particular character. So let's get into the life of Harry Keller. He was born on July 11th in the year 1849 in Erie, Pennsylvania. His parents were from Bavaria. And they had immigrated over here to America just a few years before he was born. And his mother died shortly, uh, a couple years after he was born. And uh, Mr. Keller, his father, quickly married again. And apparently from the different stories I've read, young Heinrich Keller, that's his given name when he was born, Heinrich Keller, did not get along with his stepmother and uh, tried to stay away from the house as much as possible. Heinrich, or as they called him when he was younger, Henry Keller, he's got a whole lot of names. What is it with magicians and all these names? Um, young Henry Keller did a lot to stay away from the house. He, he loved to fish, and years later when he retired, that was his favorite activity was fishing. So Keller actually said that when he was six years old, he saw a performance of the Davenport brothers for the very first time. And though there apparently is no sort of um, historical record that the Davenports performed in Erie, where the Davenports were from, is not that far from Erie, Pennsylvania. So it's possible. So imagine that he's six years old. He sees the Davenport brothers and there's his first exposure to magic, even though the Davenport's technically weren't presenting their show as magic, but still it's his first taste of magic. At 10 years old, he becomes apprenticed to a, uh, to a druggist at an apothecary there in Erie, Pennsylvania. And he's, uh, from all accounts, he's somewhat bored even with that. And one day he's mixing chemicals together, kind of doing his own little private experiments sets off an explosion and blows a hole in the ceiling and quickly decides, you know what, this is not for me either, and hops a train to New York City. So at 11 years old, he's uh, on his way to New York City to be a newspaper boy. This is where things really get interesting for young Heinrich Keller. He soon uh, stumbles upon an advertisement in the newspaper, uh, an ad looking for a gentleman who is looking for an apprentice of sorts or an assistant of sorts. The fellow's name was Isaiah Hughes. He performed as a character known as the Fakir of Ava, which was you know, just, that's his performing character, his performing name. He was a magician. He was looking for uh, a young assistant. It's kind of a, you know, somebody to, uh, a gopher, as they used to say, you go for this, you go for that, you pick this up, you pick that up and do all the heavy lifting so that the star of the show doesn't have to do that. So that's what, uh, Harry Keller went to apply for that particular job. And apparently when he got there, he knocked on the, uh, the door there of the Fakir of Ava's house and this dog jumped up on him and was licking his hand and everything. And from the back room, he could hear the Fakir of Ava, Mr. Hughes, call him in, come on in young man. And, uh, Heinrich Keller went in and the two of them began to talk. And he said, well, I'm here for the, for the assistance job, for the apprentice job. And Isaiah Hughes says, well, young man, I have news for you. You've been hired just like that. Just like that. He was hired. What, what is that all about? And then he explained to him throughout the day, different people have showed up to apply for the job. And it seemed that everyone that showed up, his dog, Isaiah Hughes's dog, would bark at them, just continuously bark and growl at them. Harry Keller was the first one to show up that the dog actually liked. And he figured, hey, if my dog likes you, then I'm going to like you. And that's how Harry Keller really gets into the world of magic as an assistant apprentice to the Fakir of Ava. Now, the first few years that Keller worked for the Fakir of Ava, it wasn't just being the gopher going for this or that. He was also learning the craft of magic. And by the time he was 16 years old, he decided that he wanted to give his own performances for the first time. And reluctantly, the Fakir of Ava gave him his blessing, said, go ahead and do your best. And apparently, from all accounts, uh, Keller's first few performances were horrendous, if that 
word could be applied here. They weren't very good. And at 16, and after a few failures, young Harry Keller went back to the Fakir of Ava and continued his apprenticeship with him. And I think that's okay. I mean, you know, <laughs> youth, don't you love it? You're always so excited. You're always, you know, oh, I can, I've got it now. I can go do this. And, and sure enough, even a uh, hundred years ago uh, or more, even young Harry Keller had that same gumption to go out there before he was ready and fell on his face. And, um, Unfortunately, the Fakir of Ava took him back and they continued their apprenticeship and their uh, working together. And then when he was 18, sure enough, Harry Keller decided to, uh, to try it again, to go out on his own. And at this point, he was more than ready. By all accounts, this, this newer performance was a big success. And Harry, at this point, he was 18 years old, decided it was time to go out on his own. The year was 1867. And he spent the next two years struggling, basically. Um, he would get gigs, and um, some of them would go well, and some of them weren't, because basically uh, the whole economy in the United States at the time was very depressed. It was right after the American Civil War, so everyone was struggling, and uh, especially Harry Keller. And often he would have to skip out on hotels and skip out... Um, there was a one story that I read where he had a, uh, he was doing a, a performance and during the intermission, he snuck out the back and left because a lot of the people in the audience were creditors. So, uh, Harry was, was having a hard time being a solo performer from 1867 to 1869. But then in, uh, in 1869, the spring thereof in La Crosse, Wisconsin, he, sees an advertisement for an appearance by the Davenport brothers. You remember I mentioned them earlier where Harry Keller said at six years old, he saw the Davenport brothers for the first time. Well, now uh, the Davenports were, were appearing with William Fay. They hired Harry Keller to be their stage manager, and he continued to work with them, with the Davenports from 1869 right up until 1873. Now, frankly, I think the Davenports deserve their own podcast. So somewhere down the road, I'm going to do a podcast about the Davenport brothers. But really quickly, let me just tell you about their act. They were uh, two performers, two brothers that decided to join this movement called spiritualism, but they weren't actually spiritualists, nor were they religious people. They just created an act where it appeared that they were in communication with the spirits, more or less. What they did was they had a, a big cabinet, a big wooden cabinet built that was often on saw horses, so it was raised somewhat off the uh, the floor. And the, there were two chairs inside this cabinet, and the Davenport brothers, one would be tied uh, in a chair on one side, and another would be tied to the opposite chair. In the center of the cabinet would be a small table with the uh, like a small guitar and um, tambourine and bells and this sort of thing. And then um, they would close the cabinet doors. So there were, or they should say they would have the cabinet doors closed. And the moment the doors would close, you'd hear ringing sounds. You'd hear the bell ringing and the tambourines and things being thrown around. And then you'd open the doors and why the Davenports were still tied uh, in place. It was an amazing act. This was called the Spirit Cabinet, obviously. And when Harry Keller went to work with them, he was the stage manager for this particular act, for their Spirit Cabinet act. And somewhere along the way, Keller learned the secret to the Spirit Cabinet. Now, Harry Keller was originally hired as, a, as an assistant to the Davenport brothers, but over a period of time, he got promoted, and he went from being an assistant to a stage manager to an advance man to their business manager. So you'd think with all these positive things happening that uh, Keller's career with the Davenport brothers would be very uh, long-lived, but uh, something happened in uh, 1873. They were at a train station, and uh, one of the brothers, William told him to go fetch a bunch of stuff and do a bunch of things. And Harry balked and uh, William Davenport said, 
Well, you may as well know you're my servant. So among being the assistant and stage manager and advance man and business manager, uh, he was also William Davenport's servant. Well, it didn't sit so well with Harry Keller, so he decided, well, that's it. I'm done. Goodbye. But he didn't just leave. He took William Fay with him as well. William Fay was the, the chief assistant for the Davenport brothers. So here in 1873, the Davenport brothers are out on their own, and Harry Keller has a new act called Fay and Keller. And you'll never guess what the feature of the Fay and Keller act was. That's right, the Spirit Cabinet. That was the feature of their program. Now, they had a, a pretty successful run. They were traveling all over the United States and eventually down into Mexico and South America. And they came into a, a problem, a logistical problem, while traveling throughout Mexico. And that was that big old Spirit Cabinet that they had was just uh, impractical to carry from town to town. So they came up with a solution, and that was... Why not just build a new cabinet when we get into each new town? So when I first found out about this, I was like, wow, that means that there are 20 or 30 Harry Keller spirit cabinets possibly still in Mexico today. How crazy is that? But that was the situation. And it must have been a pretty good one because uh, the Mexican tour alone netted them about $10,000. So... This was working out very good for Keller and Fay. Now, we're going to move forward just a little bit. This is the same tour, and this is uh, after they finished their tour of uh, South America. By July of 1875, the South American tour was complete, and Fay and Keller got on board a steamship called the Boyne and set sail for London. They had, been, they had smooth sailing across the Atlantic Ocean and made it safely to Portugal, on Wednesday, August 11th, the steamship Boyan set sail from Lisbon for London, and there were no problems with the weather until Friday morning when a thick fog set in. And it was at this point they plotted a course which would take them 15 miles west off the coast of Ushant Island. They checked the depth of the sea at 5 p.m., and it was 450 feet deep. Another reading was taken at 7.15 p.m., when the forward lookout alerted the captain that rocks were spotted. This information comes from a book called The Shipwrecked Mariner, dated 1875. The book says that Captain Macaulay, who was on the bridge, immediately ordered the engines to be stopped and the helm put hard a port. However, the, the ship hit the rocks right off the coast of the island of Moline. The captain commanded that the lifeboats be lowered and safely got passengers and crew into the boats in an orderly fashion. The book says that this all happened without confusion. The lifeboats were full of passengers and crew and were taken to the island of Moline. Once the passengers were safe on the island, the captain, the captain actually returned uh, and stayed with his ship. The next morning, Saturday, August 4th, the ship's uh, crew returned via the lifeboats to the Boyne in an effort to salvage what they could. A few bags uh, belonging to passengers were recovered, but most were lost. The shipwrecked mariner states that within an hour of hitting the rocks, the level of water uh, was over the deck, and the divers discovered the rocks completely penetrated the bottom of the ship. The Boyne was finished, and so were the hopes of Fay and Keller because uh, apparently they couldn't retrieve their show equipment, nor their valuables. According to Harry Keller's book, A Magician's Tour, he had two chests of curios uh, from Mexico and South America, including stuffed birds, images, a Mexican saddle mounted with solid silver, a Mex Mexican suit that cost like $500, uh, specimens of the gold and silver currency from every country they visited. He had about $8,000 worth of cut and uncut Brazilian diamonds. The estimated loss amounted to around $25,000. And given that this baggage was under water for 137 years, hmm, I wouldn't think that the clothes of, or much of the curios would still be recoverable, but I'm wondering about the gold and silver coins and diamonds. 
Hmm. If the diamonds were, uh, what they, if they, if they were worth 8,000 back then, they'd wor- be worth about a hundred thousand dollars today. Hmm. I'd have to say that, uh, the drawing that I've seen of the shipwrecked boy, and along with the knowledge that the ship's final resting place was off the coast of the island of Moline, gives a pretty good description where the ship re- uh, shipwreck remains. Unfortunately, yours truly is no diver, and uh, <laughs> can't do much about that. And actually, there is a little bit of an update on that. Um, after I originally discovered this, uh, I shared it with a friend of mine who came back with the uh, this little bit of information it would appear that some of the gold and diamonds had been found by the crew during the salvage efforts. Uh, one of the articles uh, that he was shared with me states that the crew was helping themselves. And when they were discovered, they tossed the items back into the sea. And the, uh, the crew that did this were arrested. Uh, another attempt to bring up the valuables was attempted, but it uh, produced nothing. And according to an article in the Otaga Daily Times, October 26th, 1875, it was believed the treasure had either been secretly removed or sunk so deeply into the sand that it was nearly impossible to find. So it appears that Harry Keller's treasure was either pilfered by the crew or potentially lost forever or... It's still there. It's just so deep into the uh, ocean floor that would be difficult to find. But then again, if you're a diver, well, maybe it might be something you want to check into. Who knows? Can you imagine finding Harry Keller's lost treasure? Wow. That would be cool. And I get the scoop. I get the scoop if you find it. So just let me know. All right, so let's recap here a little bit. So Harry Keller and William Fay, they're touring throughout Mexico, South America, and Cuba. They uh, they end up uh, having a pretty successful run. They've got thousands of dollars in uh, some of it in gold doubloon, some of it in diamonds, some of it in, in other kinds of currency. They get on a boat. They go to uh, they go to Europe, and the boat. Uh, crashes into the rocks and sinks and they lose not just all the money that they had accumulated but they lose all their props they lose their show they lose their clothes they lose everything and now they're stranded in europe this could be bad news for just about anybody i know in my case i don't think i'd be too happy to be in that predicament harry keller he contacts his father who wires some money to him so uh, they can make it to London. And while he's in London, he learns about the latest sensation in the world of magic over in Europe. And it's an effect called the Vanishing Birdcage, created by the French magician Bautier de Colta. Keller meets a cousin, a supposed cousin of de Colta's, and purchases... A birdcage, a vanishing birdcage from this person who claims to be Decolta's cousin. Of course, Decolta never uh, authorized this, so this was all done secretly. In any event, Keller purchases the vanishing birdcage. He gets on the boat back to America. He gets to America with uh, the shirt on his back and uh, this vanishing birdcage. So the first thing he does is he goes to uh, the Hearts Magic Shop, and he says, let me show you something. And he demonstrates the vanishing birdcage. And the proprietor says, wow. And Keller says, I will trade you the secret to the vanishing birdcage if you will rebuild my show for me. And he agrees to it, and that's how Keller gets back on his feet. And that's also how The Vanishing Birdcage is introduced to American audiences and American magicians, because before too long, probably every magician in America was presenting some version of the the Vanishing Birdcage mystery. Now, the name of this particular mystery probably should be called The Vanishing Bird and Cage, or Vanishing Bird and Bird Cage, because the way Keller presented it, he would put a live canary in the cage, he'd hold it between, hold the cage between his hand uh, with the uh, the canary in there. He'd count to three and the cage and the bird would disappear. Boom, like that. 
and uh, it was a great mystery. It was a great mystery back then, uh, back in 1875. And hey, it's a great mystery today too. But I guess Keller, probably one of the first, was embroiled in a controversy. And the controversy was that uh, every time he made the cage disappear, he was killing a bird. And this this controversy happened to many performers uh, I think Keller was probably the first, and a lot of performers would, would mark the bird somehow so that later when they would reproduce the bird, you, he could say, hey, look, this is the original bird that we made disappear, and I'm not killing birds. Although apparently some people uh, weren't so fortunate and actually were killing birds uh, in the process. So keep in mind, this is the, uh, the 19th century. There's, uh, just to go off on a little bit of a tangent about the vanishing birdcage, a few performers that uh, featured the Vanishing Bird Cage over the years. You had Carl Hertz, Harry Blackstone Sr., uh, David Bamberg, who was known as Fu Manchu, Fred Keating, Arnold De Beer, Survey Leroy, John Booth, Fraxen. Uh, in modern times, you had Walter Zaney Blaney, uh, Harry Blackstone Jr., Lance Burton, Billy McComb, Jonathan Pendragon, Tommy Wonder, James Demir, uh, probably Blackstone Jr., is the best known for the vanishing birdcage. Um, but my favorite routine actually comes from Survey Leroy. Yes, I keep talking about Survey Leroy, but he was a genius. Um, he'd been doing the vanishing birdcage for years, and what he would do, Survey Leroy, was the first to repeat the vanish with a member of the audience putting their hands upon the cage. And after the cage vanished, Leroy would have the spectators check to see if uh, the cage was somewhere on his body. Surveyor Leroy would then stand on a raised platform. Uh, he would have two spectators join him, and he would begin to take off his jacket. He would take off his shirt. Uh, he would actually strip right down to his undergarments, just to prove that the cage actually had disappeared. I, I, I think about this, <laughs> what a sight this must have been. Here's this guy... And he's standing there in his uh, in his socks and underwear just to prove that he made a bird in a cage disappear into thin air. But it's uh, it's genius. Oh, and I'm sorry. One quick correction: it wasn't uh, wasn't the magic shop uh, run by Hearts. It was actually um, Henry Stone who was uh, who built magic apparatus. Uh, so Keller went to him and said. Here's the, uh, I'll trade you the secret to the vanishing bird cage in exchange to have my show rebuilt uh, and all the apparatus uh, replaced. And, and he did. And lo and behold, Harry Keller was uh, back to performing once again. However, when he did return to performing at this point, it was without William Fay. And I'm going to go ahead and wrap up today's podcast right there. Uh, the year is 1875, so it's at the end of 1875. There's the shipwreck. There's the birdcage story. Uh, he and William Fay, Keller and William Fay, go their own ways. And so when I pick it up next time, uh, we'll start with uh, Keller and the Royal Illusionists. But for now, I hope you've enjoyed episode eight of the Magic Detective podcast and uh, part one of the amazing Harry Keller. I do want to encourage you to go visit my blog if you get a chance, which is at themagicdetective.com. And as I mentioned earlier, my documentary that is going to be on French TV this week. And uh, once it airs, I'll be able to put a link up on the uh, magicdetective.com blog. And I also want to mention something that, a book that just came out, it just debuted at NEMCA this past weekend, a 276-page biography called Frederick Eugene Powell, Master of Magic and Mystery, written by Tom Ewing. They debuted this at the uh, the Yankee Gathering, the, the uh, NEMCA convention this past weekend, as I just mentioned. And it's all about Frederick Eugene Powell, who was... Uh, one of the deans of the Society of American Magicians. I cannot wait to get this book. This is going to be such a fascinating read. Uh, the more I look into the life of Frederick Eugene Powell, the more amazing it is. I actually saw a video of an older uh, Powell performing, and he did a number of effects, but I remember watching him do his linking rings and uh, just being captivated by 
his his particular routine. In fact, one move in particular really uh, was like, wow, I haven't seen that before. And apparently it was an old-timers move. A lot of people did it back in the day, but uh, not one that you see anymore. And I thought, well, that's coming back. That's coming back because that's a great... Uh, a great routine that he did, but I just wanted to mention that uh, the uh, the book on Powell, uh, Master of Magic and Mystery by Tom Ewing, and uh, hey, where can I get a copy of that? Well, it's available through the website uh, 1878press.com, that's 1878press.com, and it's not on the website at the moment, uh, if you happen to go over there and check for it, you're not going to see it. But they do happen to have other fantastic books all on the history of magic. But I imagine very soon, uh, probably within a few days, you'll see the uh, Frederick Eugene Powell book listed on uh, on that website. And you can purchase it there. Uh, but, hey, while you're there on the 1878press.com uh, website, you can see some other really amazing books. Like, for example... There's a book on Milborn Christopher called Milborn Christopher, The Man and His Magic by Bill Rauscher. There is the Silent Mora book written by Bill Rauscher. There's a fantastic book called The Death Camp Magicians by Bill Rauscher. And, oh, and then there's uh, this uh, uh, Kalanag, uh, The Magician of the Third Reich, kind of a scrapbook sort of thing by... Uh, uh, Bill Rauscher and um, it, oh, and Hardeen, Monarch of Miracles by Bill Rauscher. He's Mr. Rauscher is a prolific author and a fantastic writer on magic history. And um, uh, jokingly, they're making fun. There are some other titles there by other people, but I love the fact that Bill Rauscher has written so many books and they're and I love them, they're great. So uh, go over there and check that out and look for, uh, keep your eye on the new Frederick Eugene Powell book, which should be uh, available anytime. And uh, that's going to do it for episode eight of the Magic Detective podcast. Uh, if you uh, wouldn't mind, please like the uh, episode and share it with others and subscribe. Don't forget to subscribe. And I will be back shortly. Uh, when I say shortly, I'm not sure how long that will be because I'm getting ready to go out of town again. But uh, I will be back soon with uh, part two of the, um, the Amazing Life of Harry Keller. Until then, you take care, have a happy Thanksgiving, and I'll see you soon.